So, uh, yeah, I was and, and still am, I suppose, to a certain extent, um, uh, satellite and projection designer. Um, and I joined ETC a couple of years ago now as the training program coordinator. Um, and two years in, I'm still not entirely sure I know what that means. Um, but, you know, we, we, we pumble along and, and, and we do things and, and we try and help people as much as we can. So I guess that's that's me, really. Um, yeah. So um, are we waiting for anyone else? Do we Are we recording? No, no, do we need to do? Can, I, can I just do my thing? Yeah, and I'll let anyone in if they appear late. So Fine. Don't worry. Um, does that button work? No, that button doesn't work. How do you advance slides on this thing? There we go. You can tell I'm really up to date, up to speed on on technology. Okay, excellent. <laughs> cool. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about LED. I'm going to try and be as manufacturer agnostic as possible. Um, he says with a big ETC logo in the top right hand corner. Um, but uh, I, I think the, these principles kind of apply to any to any fixture um, because they're all based on the same kind of principle. So I think it doesn't matter whose fixtures you're using. Um, they, in theory, uh, more or less all behave, behave the same sort of way. So um, when we think of LEDs, there are sort of two main sort of categories, if you like, of LEDs. Um, there are what we call the narrow band emitters, uh, and those are the very sort of monochromatic LEDs, and that's the traditional red, green, blue. And um, they're narrow band because they are designed to emit light in a very specific frequency. So there's not a lot of, of wiggle room either side of that. It's either, it's quite a pure red, quite a pure green, and and uh, what's left, quite a pure blue. Um, so, and that's why if, if that, you know, when LED technology first came out and that was all we had was these RGB uh, fixtures, they were not great. Their, their color rendering wasn't brilliant. They're fine if you are uh, putting them up against a white surface where you've got nothing to compare them against. But as soon as you introduce anything that interferes with that beam, whether it's a costume, an actor, a piece of scenery, that's when you start noticing the sort of pitfalls of these uh, narrow band emitters. So their biggest problems, obviously, is the limited color gamut, um, very, very narrow band, narrow spike. And as a result of that, they give you very, very poor rendering of color. Fine on a white surface, um, but on anything other than that, uh, probably not great. Uh, and there we go. Um, and, you know, they, they, they work best as sort of solutions for, for site lighting uh, where you where it is just a white surface. And that's kind of all that you're, you're having to deal with. Um, and obviously, as technology, oh, animations going on here. Um, as technology improved, uh, they started to experiment and they started to play around, and we ended up with what we now refer to as broadband emitters. And basically, what they are is they are a blue LED, um, a high intensity blue LED that's got a phosphor coating on it, and it's that phosphor coating that the blue light excites, uh, which gives off light. Um, and one of the first LEDs that sort of became mainstream for us that did this was the white LED, because there is no such thing naturally as a white LED. It's always a blue LED uh, with a phosphor coating on it. And while it was good to get a white light out of it, what you had is you had this white light with this really big blue spike uh, popping out the front. And that was why the colors still weren't rendering correctly. Um, and uh, sorry, we've got violin lessons that have just started in the background. So um, it's not my bad choice of music as sort of backtrack. It's just what's happening in the other room. Um, uh, yeah, so so we had this, this huge spike of blue uh, and that's why colors were still sort of not rendering um, terribly correctly. Um, they do have a wider color gamut. As you can see, they tend to be a slightly fuller spectrum. As a result, they offer better color rendering uh, and what they did is, uh, as sort of technologies have improved, they realized that with different com chemical compositions in the phosphors, that was where we got our warm whites, our cool whites, our ambers, limes, mint, uh, and there are a bunch of other emitters now that are all uh, broad-based uh, emitters that all use different sort of phosphor combinations. The problem with them all still is this huge blue spike uh, that we're having to deal with. Um, one of the questions I think that we get thrown at uh, as a manufacturer is why we have so many different colors in our fixtures. Most manufacturers, you know, will do RGBW, um, 
RGBL is quite common, RGBA is quite common, but there's usually typically only four. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. The main reason is there is a chap whose name I can never remember, but he owns the worldwide patent on any LED fixture that uses more than four colors in its mixing system. So anyone who uses five, six, seven, or eight, as we do now, colors in the mixing system for every fixture that gets made, he gets a royalty on that. Um, so that's nice. I wish I'd thought of that, um, but there we go. So uh, that's why a lot of the manufacturers, in order to avoid paying that royalty, they cap it at four, uh, at four colors. Um, but aside from that, uh, we've got, we've had some fixtures in our range that are four colors. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about those because we've released a few new ones recently. Um, but basically the, the theory behind the number of colors is the more colors you put into your array, the broader the spectrum that you're going to be able to generate and the more subtle the colors that you can mix will be, the better the crossfades will be, the better the color rendering will be. Uh, so we spent a lot of time uh, you, you know, researching this. We, we've got within ETC, there's a group called the ARG. Um, anyone who knows ETC knows we love our little three-letter abbreviations. And ARG is the Advanced Research Group. Uh, and that's what they do. We basically lock them in a dark room and we feed crackers and water under the door and that sort of come back a month later and they have things for us to look at. Um, so, uh, and, and, and they spend a lot of time researching colour um, and that's a lot of where those sort of color controls and things that we have and the, the combinations of arrays that we use, they all come out of, uh, out of those sort of groups and, and people sitting and, and, and experimenting and, and trying things out. Um, so obviously the most common LEDs that you're gonna find in your fixtures are your red, green, and indigo. Um, and I'm gonna call it indigo. Um, it's become an industry standard to say red, green, blue. It's actually not a blue. The actual blue emitter is much, much lighter. The emitter that they actually use as a standard in the RGB fixtures is actually an indigo. Some manufacturers call it royal blue, um, but it, it's that really, really deep uh, saturated blue. Um, so that kind of sort of forms the basis of, of our sort of primary colors, our, our red, green, blue, or red, green, indigo, um, as the case may be. And those three emitters are narrow band emitters. And what we've done is with each of those emitters is we plot them against what we call a spectral power distribution graph. Um, and then we map that onto the CIE chromaticity diagram so we can kind of see what's possible. So um, having a look here, you can see you've got your sort of three little spikes of your, uh, of your three primary colors. Um, and if I pop up the next slide. So if we just have a look at uh, sunlight and sort of tungsten lamp, incandescent lamp, which are both sort of considered to be full spectrum light sources. If you have a look at that spectrum versus what the SPD of, of, of the RGI emitters are, you can see how much of that spectrum is just not there and is just not represented in those in those three colors. And that's one of the reasons why we've started to add more colors in is to try and fill out the spectrum uh, and try and give you uh, as complete a spectrum uh, as possible. So if we look on the chromaticity graph, you can see you've got your, your indigo, your red and your, and your green points. And the reason most of them use the indigo and not the blue emitter is because it gets you right down into that bottom corner, which gives you those amazing magentas and things that you can get out of LEDs that you can't really get out of anything else. Um, love them or hate them, and perhaps we'll have a conversation a bit later on about how much we like them and don't like them. Um, th there are things that we can do now with LED that we've just not been able to ever do before, and I find that incredibly exciting um, as, as an LD, just the control that we now have uh, and the power to manipulate color uh, is just something that we've never had before. So if I'm just looking at a little chromaticity graph, so the, the, the three points on the graph uh, peg the colors and then there's this curve that runs through and that's the black body locus, that's your color temperature curve. So coming in from uh, daylight sitting around here, sort of five, 600 or six and a half thousand and coming all the way back around this curve down to probably sort of 1900, somewhere around there. Uh, so that's that's what that little curve um, is representing. So uh, 
what's next? So the next color that we added in uh, to our fixtures was an actual blue um, emitter. And there you can see on its SPD, it sort of sits there. And if you have a look on that little chromaticity diagram, it sits sort of just up above that little indigo emitter. And that doesn't look like much of a change, but actually you can see how much of that how many sort of other colors within the spectrum have opened up? You've got this whole sort of wedge of color that's opened up in there that wasn't sort of available to you uh, previously. And uh, most of our fixtures, with exception of um, the new source forward color, they have both the indigo and the blue emitters in them. Um, and the reason we've done that is because it enables you to get those really soft blues. It gives you better, it gives you better whites because you don't have that very, very oversaturated indigo in there. Um, so it mixes much better whites. It mixes much better uh, color temperatures, better on skin tones. Uh, so that's sort of why uh, that lives in there. Uh, the next one uh, that we threw in was amber, and amber's by no means unique to us. People have been using the amber emitter for ages. Um, and you can see it, it sort of lives down there in the spectrum, and it doesn't offer a huge amount of output. There's not a very sort of powerful color. But what it does, if you have a look at that little chromaticity graph, you can see how it's pulled this curve out on the side, opening up to that sort of portion of the amber spectrum. And what that's done is that's opened up this lower end of color temperature. All of those sort of lower end, anything from probably sort of about 3 to Kelvin down was always really tricky to get without that amber emitter. Putting that amber in there, it gives you access um, to all those uh, lower, warmer tones. So when you're doing your sunsets uh, and your firesides and your candle flickers and all those kind of things, that amber is hugely, hugely helpful um, as a uh, as a means to sort of warm up the light. Um, uh, we'll get on to you onto color mixes in a sec. Um, so yeah, so there we go. It, it opens up all the subtle yellows, ambers. Uh, it opens up a range of yellow greens that hasn't been proud, that possible. And the amber is a broad band emitter. So it's not just that amber, it's opening up a little bit of everything as well. Um, so it just sort of rounds that that curve out. It's, it's a much sort of more gentle ease in and ease out uh, of that color. Uh, then the next one that we brought in quite a few years ago, I said this was not going to be manufacturer agnostic and I've done the thing was to go wee 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 all the time, but there we go. Anyway, so be it. Um, <laughs> so we were the first uh, manufacturers to introduce the Lime uh, emitter uh, with our Series 2 um, LED. And the LED, the Lime is also a broadband emitter and you can see it's it really is a broadband uh, spectrum and it's just pulled out on the chromaticity curve you can it's now opened up that whole sort of spectrum rounding out uh, towards the green uh, it's really really good for color rendering what it's done uh, for the ability to things to render color was huge the the change it made um, was was huge because what we did is we replaced the white if you remember the series one we used to have a white uh, LED in there and the white was swapped out for the lime and Basically, we eliminated that big blue spike that exists in the white LED and replaced it with this broadband spectrum. And that just opened up the color rendering uh, capabilities of the fixture. It is an incredibly efficient LED and it's really, really good for lumen count. And this is the one thing to watch out. Uh, that's why a lot of the other manufacturers put the lime into their fixture is uh, it makes their numbers look good on the spec sheet because they can they can drive that lime and they can really get a high lumen count coming out of the front of the fixture. So it's good for it's good for specifications. Uh, and one of the reasons I think why it's so effective is because that lime uh, aligns with our eyes peak sensitivity. It just happens to sit at that frequency uh, that's just that our eyes are particularly in tune to, which is why it looks so bright and, and renders colors so well. Um, and it doesn't appear to do it on this graph because there's not much of a sort of bounce out on that chromaticity curve. But what it does is it hugely increases the subtlety of the color gamut um, because it's such so good at rendering and because lime is actually mixed into a lot of colors. Um, it's it means you can do a lot more subtle things because you have that one color that's almost consistent now through it, uh, probably 75% of, of your other color range. Um, 
so when you're crossfading from one color to the other, uh, it's it's an easier thing for the fixture to manage because it's there's a sort of common uh, denominator, if you like, that sits uh, within all your color spectrums. Um, so the lime we chat about this, it sort of sits at that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's sort of right in our peak sensitivity. Uh, and proof of that is with the high-vis jackets. It's one of the reasons why high-vis jackets are high-vis. It's because their color is absolutely that frequency that our eye is most sensitive to. Um, uh, I think it was Plaza. When when was the last Plaza we did? Uh, a year, a bit ago now. Um, you know, you all have to wear high-vis jackets when you when you're rigging on on the show floor. Uh, and one of the people opposite our stand, I forget who they were. They were all in black high-vis jackets, so they had the little silver bands, but the rest of it was black. And I kind of thought that's a defeat of the object of a high-vis jacket a little bit. Um, but you know, hey ho. Um, I suppose it it ticked a health and safety box. Uh, then the next emitter that we popped in was the cyan emitter. Um, and there are not too many other manufacturers who do this. I know Roby has it in their DL7. I know the cyan lives in there. Um, and it's possibly living in some of the other fixtures. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I don't think it's in uh, the new ProLights offering, um, but I speak under correction. Um, but science is, is quite a, is, is a punchy little LED. Um, and you can see that sort of lives up here on the sort of left-hand side of the CIE. And you can see by adding in that cyan, that huge chunk of spectrum that's just opened up. Um, there's a huge wedge of color that lives in this sort of portion of the spectrum that you're just not able to get to without that cyan emitter uh, being in the fixture. And believe it or not, the cyan is actually really, really important for skin tones. What that cyan does for rendering of skin tone um, and across all skin tones um, is is huge and it's it's significant and it's one of those things that you don't you don't know you need it or you didn't know you need it until you've got it and you can sort of compare things and you go like it's actually extraordinary the the difference that that cyan chip makes. Um, it widens out the color gamut um, and you know it gives you all that extra range, the subtle greens, the subtle blues. Um, Anyone who, who knows my work knows that I'm, I'm a big fan of, of green. So anything that gives me more shades of green to play with uh, definitely uh, makes me happy. Uh, and then, so that was, that's the sort of seven colors that lives in our, um, our series two um, array. I don't know if, it's, if there's anything that's come out of that. If anybody has anything they want to throw at me uh, before I move on, um, feel free to interrupt uh, any time if you do. Um, so what we've done is we have introduced uh, the new color mixing series. We're calling it the X8 array or our series three um, array. And what this does is this introduces a deep red LED emitter. Uh, and the first fixture that has this is our studio FOSS4 panels. Um, we've done a panel light now for TV and film, uh, basically to compete with the ARRI Sky panel. Um, and this is the first of our fixtures that has uh, the deep red emitter in it. And um, that really lives right off here on the far end of the spectrum. And you can see it's kind of just added in here at the bottom. And that doesn't look like it's made a huge difference. But the one thing to know about this chromaticity diagram is it's not linear. So a small increase there is not, doesn't necessarily equate to a small um, rendering output of the fixture. The difference this deep red made uh, is extraordinary. It's it's quite unbelievable. Um, it, you know, it, it's a problem we've had. I mean, anyone who's had to use LEDs, uh, certainly in, in sort of front light, where you've been relying on them for faces, even something like the Series 2, which is, which is pretty good as they go, it's never quite right. You always just feel there's something missing. There's something that's just not tungsten, really. Um, and and that that largely has gone away with the introduction of this deep red emitter because it's filled that lower warm end of the spectrum that's kind of been missing a little bit um, from uh, from previous fixtures. Um, we are again. This is my another non-agnostic agnostic moment. Um, we are the only manufacturer to the moment to use the deep red emitter, and we have a I believe it's a three. It might be a five year. 
uh, exclusivity on it. So no other manufacturer is going to be able to roll this out on their products, um, certainly for the next three years, but I seem to think it's longer. Um, it's fantastic on skin tones. It, it really just lifts things out. Um, and again, it's just widened out that color gamut and also brilliant for your sunsets, for your candle lights, uh, your sort of warm glows, fireside, anything like that. Um, it's, it's made a huge difference. And the big thing with it is it's actually red. It's, it's not a sort of orangey red. And you don't realize how um, orangey red uh, the early LEDs, the, the red we've been using is. And now, again, this graphic may or may not read depending on how your screens are set up. Um, but on this side, on the sort of right-hand side of that image, that's the traditional red. Uh, and you can see compared next to the deep red on the left, uh, it's actually quite orange by comparison. Um, so, and again, depends on, on how your screens are set up with color temperature settings, things like that as to how well this reads. Um, but the change is is huge. And you can see it here on this graph, that's sort of where it where it sits. It's really right off to the end. It's sort of as as close to infrared uh, as we can get and still be in the sort of visible portion of the spectrum. Uh, if I just flip that graph around so it actually matches uh, the emitters. So you've now got the red on the left and the deep red uh, on the right hand side. Um, I sort of think of it as our universal skin tone tool. It's it's what's been missing and it's certainly been missing on camera. You can see, I'll show you some pictures of the moment of some camera tests we did. Um, the difference is huge, but uh, in a live environment as well, the addition of this deep red uh, is significant, particularly if you've got uh, fixtures sitting out in uh, front of house. Um, so on the left-hand side, so what we've got is this is the same shot uh, with the phosphor panel is what's lighting this and it's trimmed to uh, four and a half uh, thousand degrees Kelvin. And on the left-hand side, that's no deep red. And on the right-hand side, that's with the deep red emitter. And you can see that difference is huge. That skin tone has just come to life. The the reds are popping, the, the lavenders are pulling out. It's just that the change is, is extraordinary. I say it's one of those things you didn't know you were missing um, until you actually uh, see it in there. Uh, so that is the new X8 uh, spectrum. So we've got indigo, blue, cyan, green, lime, amber, red, and deep red. And that makes up um, the new X8. And at the moment, it's available in the Phosphor panel. And last week, I believe, we released the Phosphor Fresnel. So it is now available in a Fresnel version as well. Um, it is part of the studio line, studio range of fittings, part of the Phosphor range. Uh, and it is uh, priced accordingly uh, at the moment because it's it's priced for their market and it's got the pole operator controls and all that kind of stuff on it that, that they need. Um, you didn't hear this here, um, but there may be something coming that is uh, uses this technology, but is more within the theatrical world of, uh, of budgets. Uh, so watch the space. Uh, and then if you, you know, if you, if you compare the X8 uh, spectrum to back to our daylight and to our uh, incandescent, you can see you've actually got that full spectrum of light available. It, all the colors are present. Uh, and they're there and they're sort of available to use. Um, and that's kind of sort of what's uh, what's missing on, and in some of our fixtures as well, where you don't have all the colors, there are bits of that spectrum that are missing. Um, and, and, and you notice it, and that's why things don't always render as accurately uh, as you'd hoped them to. Um, but with the new X8 uh, array, hopefully we've, um, we, we, we've addressed most of those issues. Uh, so I guess the big question really is, you know, for all these colors that we're putting in the fixtures and all the colors that it's sort of capable of, of uh, spitting out, the real question for us really is how many colors can we see? Um, I don't know how many of you will remember, but when high-end systems years and years ago released the studio color, so I'm talking probably almost 20 years ago now, uh, it was advertised as having 16.7 million colors. That was a CMY uh, wash light. Um, and, you know, everyone's going, oh, 16.7 million colors. That's amazing. 
all that was is it's a simple maths. You've got three colors, 256 steps per color, multiply that out, that gives you 16.7 million colors. Can you actually see 16.7 million colors? Yeah, no, probably not. You know, the difference between one one little DMX step on a cyan wheel is probably you're not going to see it. Um, so, you know, is it a million? Is it 128? Is it 32? Uh, you know, we don't really know. And it's a really hard thing to measure. Um, if you have a look at this, uh, at this little graphic, um, here you start seeing. So each, uh, each of these little sort of sections is 10 colors. So that's we've taken the spectrum and it's been divided into 100 uh, individual colors. And you can see uh, from the banding um, how many colors our eyes are actually able to sort of start distinguishing. Uh, here in the sort of green range, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, that our eyes can actually see as, as being different. And once we sort of come out of that sort of peak sensitivity and we pull into the blues and the magentas, we start seeing a lot more uh, color separation. And if I just zoom in to that green and that blue. So again, I'm zooming in there. We've taken that little narrow little portion and again split that into 100 colors. Um, and you can, it's hardly discernible from one color to the next where it sort of stops and starts just at, at either extreme. You can just start seeing a little bit of banding uh, that our eyes are able to sort of pick up as um, uh, as being different different colors. So, you know, the, the argument is to, oh, uh, you know, that, that fixtures are capable of producing X number of million colors. It doesn't really matter because it's, it's, it, it's up to us to determine uh, the degree of variation. And a lot of that comes down to how we put our shows together and how you mix colors and making sure that, you, that you're that you choosing colors that are far enough apart spectrally that your eye actually is capable of clocking uh, clocking that shift in, in color. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, metamers and metamerism. And... Um, this for me is the one area of, of lighting and LED that I find really, really exciting because it's something that we just have not been able to do uh, before. Before LED came in, obviously this is not new. We've, we've had control over it for a while. Um, but I wanted to touch on it because um, in, in chatting to various people, it was still sort of something that people weren't quite 100% sure of, of what it was all about. So I spent a little bit of time uh, looking on that. Um, so the Wikipedia definition is metamerism is perceived as a matching of colors uh, with different spectral power distributions. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but, you know, you might in the days where we could still go into fitting rooms and, and try on clothes, you know, you would kind of try on something. And in the fitting room light, it appeared to be a sort of blue shirt. And then you go out into the daylight and actually it's quite green or vice versa. Uh, and that's kind of metamerism at play. It's how well colors render themselves uh, under different light conditions. Um, so, you know, here, for instance, uh, you know, lit, lit with a sort of neutral white light, the two orange balls appear exactly the same. But as soon as I put a very particular frequency of orange on them, the one ball almost disappears because it has a different uh, color makeup, if you like. Uh, and so it renders differently. And that is kind of really metamerism and it's something that we've now become able to control uh, and it's something that we haven't been able to really control uh, traditionally when you're sort of dealing with tungsten fixtures and gels it's uh, that those choices uh, have been made for you already uh, so there's not a lot of option whereas now with LED uh, we have a lot more control um, so I like to think of of uh, metamers as being color recipes how how you sort of want to make up um, that particular shade of amber or pink or blue or green or whatever it happens uh, to be. So if we pop back at our, our little CIE space, um, if I start with uh, just two colors, if I just have a, a sort of blue and a red, I can mix any color between that point, but in a straight line only. There's, there's only one possible way to mix that color between those two points. As soon as I add in a third color, I can now mix a color anywhere between those three points, 
but again, in one direction only. If I've got an RGB system or an RGI system, there is only one possible combination of LEDs that is going to get me to a particular color. And this is one of the reasons why colors don't render particularly well uh, on those sort of simple systems. But as soon as I add another emitter in, and whatever that is, I've chosen amber as being the first one, all of a sudden, the number of color recipes, the number of ways that I can get to a particular color uh, increases exponentially. So for instance, uh, I can get there mixing fire RGB. I can get there mixing um, amber, blue, and red. I can get there uh, with just amber and blue. Uh, I think I've got another one coming up. Oh, there we go. No, that's it. Uh, so, so the more emitters you have, the more possible ways there are that you can actually target a particular color. Uh, and that's kind of what metamerism is all about. Now, the thing for me that, that makes this a slightly terrifying concept is uh, there's kind of enough for us to worry about. We're sitting at the production desk and we're trying to light a show. You know, the last thing I want to have to worry about is which color recipe am I going to use to, you know, light this, light this scene with. I don't want to have to be thinking about that kind of stuff. And um, it's one of the reasons why uh, the color software on the EOS console exists. It's to take that uh complexity if you like um away so here's another example of metamer metamerism um i wish they'd chosen an easier word for this concept uh so there's our color board and we've got two different recipes um so both of them are mixed to uh roscoe 74 and one is just using uh indigo and cyan and the other one is an rgb uh combination you can see obviously slightly different in their in their sort of the way they render out but it's particularly noticeable on those color bands, how different those colors are actually uh, popping out. Um, so if I, what have I done? Here we go. So what we've done is uh, we have basically come up with some recipes for you uh, within the console, because we know what it's like. You're busy, you're sitting at the production desk, there's enough for you to worry about. You don't have to be worrying about every time you want to create some colors going right. You know, we can all probably mix color using CMY. We can all probably mix color using RGB and arguably RGBA or RGBW. But all of a sudden there's seven colors. I don't know when to add lime. I don't necessarily know when to add cyan or how much or any of those kind of things. There, there's sort of too many variables that have uh, come into it. So what we've done uh, is we have given you built into the console. We have three metamers that live in the console uh, for every single color swatch, for every filter manufacturer swatch that's in there. There are three metameric recipes, if you like, if that's the right word, uh, that live inside the console. And we've broken them down into brightest, spectral and hybrid and when you're in your color picker uh next to the little graph you've got this little sort of block of uh of color options and you'll notice that it's always the brightest button uh is lit up and that's because we thought as by default what we want to give you is the brightest version of that color that you could possibly start with because you know, we're in the business of light so we want to give you as much light as possible so our first recipe, the default recipe, is going to be the combination of colors that gives you the most light out of that fixture. Now, some people uh, complain that the color picker on the console is not terribly accurate and they'll sort of hit, I don't know, lead 200 and it's not what they were expecting to see. So there are a couple of reasons for this. One is the fact that we're dealing with metamers, we're dealing with recipes, and we've chosen a recipe that gives you the maximum amount of light. Now, that may not be spectrally correct as to what, how that light would be composed if it was uh, a piece of filter on a tungsten fixture, for instance. The other thing to bear in mind is uh, the, the color picker uh, information, the, the information that we feed into the color picker doesn't come from us. It's from a third party company called Carillon, uh, and they supply most of the console manufacturers with the same, inf the same data, and then it's up to them to plumb that into their consoles. Uh, the big advantage of that, of course, is everybody's color picker is probably as bad as everybody else's. Um, but what we have done is we've said, fine, if you're using... Uh, 
an ETC fixture on an ETC console. We've done a little bit of work and we've tried to match the colors as best we can. But what they did was they matched it to an American source for 110 volt source for a long life lamp. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's ever had the opportunity to, do, to use the 110 volt source fours. Um, but they are really, really bright. They put out an incredible amount of light. They, it's extraordinary how much light those things put out. But they're also at a much higher color temperature. They sit at about 3, 4, um, sometimes 3, 4, 50 Kelvin. So they're up there. Whereas we're used to seeing light that's sort of down in 3, 200 sort of world. So already for our eyes, something's not right because the color temperature is set so much higher. So one of the quickest things to do when you're playing with the... Um, with these uh, filter pickers in the console is, uh, de again, depends on the mode you've set the fixture in and, we're, and we'll chat a little bit about that. Um, but one of the easiest things to do is just knock back the color temperature a little bit, um, you know, and, and sort of bring it down back into the world that we're used to seeing. And already that'll probably make enough of a difference. Um, if it's still not enough of a difference, uh, if you tap that brightest button, it changes to spectral. And then if you reselect that color, it uses another metameric recipe to give you to match that color. Uh, but what it's done is it's now spectrally correct or as spectrally correct as possible. So we've tried our best to match what you would see if it was a filter uh, in front of a tungsten fixture. Uh, you normally sacrifice a bit of output when you go into spectral um, mode. Um, but that, you know, that, that's kind of the first option, you know, so you, maybe you pick a, a, a Roscoe 52 or something, cause you're expecting it to work particularly well on the costumes, costumes come out on stage and they just don't look the way you're expecting them to do. Um, first thing I would do is I would pop into spectral mode and reset that color and just see what it does. And often that's enough to render those costumes, um, correctly so that your, uh, costume designer doesn't come over and give you too many notes. Uh, and the third option is hybrid, and that sort of sits somewhere between the two uh, options. And those three options live in the console uh, for all the color pickers that are in there. So you, there's three recipes that live in there, you know, that give you sort of quick, easy access to things. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free to play around with those. And of course, you can obviously uh, mix your own version of that color. Uh, if you want to. So the example I'm going to have a look at is uh, Lee 058, which is a, a sort of medium lavender. Um, so uh, Lee 058, if I have a look at that. So if I'm in brightest mode, uh, you can see on this sort of spectral graph uh, how that has been made up. There's a, a lot of red in there, and I'm using the X8 system for this, so I've got the deep red emitter. Uh, there's a lot of that indigo, a little bit of blue, no green, some lime, some amber, and some red, and that's what's giving us uh, that mix. And if I flip that over to the spectral view, you can see how that color graph has changed. It's really knocked out um, a lot of that deep indigo. It's brought up the blue, it's added in some cyan, it's knocked out the lime, and it's boosted the red a little bit. Um, and the third option is a uh, hybrid. And obviously, as the name implies, that sort of sits somewhere between uh, those two worlds and that color mix. Um, and there's a really lovely feature, which I think, yes, is coming up next. And that's this little hold color point function. And I don't know if you've spent any time playing on that, um, but that also is a fantastic uh, little tool. And if I pop into the next slide. So what that does is hold color point lets you pick the color you want. You say, I love this color, but actually I want this color with a little bit more green or a little bit less red or a bit more amber. If there's a piece of costume on stage that's really not rendering correctly, but you're happy with the overall look, you can come in here and you can hold color point and uh, adjust that color. And this short little video, I think, should show that. So you can see as I'm pulling down the red, it's compensating with all the other colors is sort of balancing at the same time. Uh, to, to make those adjustments. And you'll get to the point where it says limit reached. And it means if you move beyond that point, you're in the world of creating a new color. You are no longer within your Leo 58 or Roscoe 58 world. Um, so it will tell you when something horrible is 
uh, is going to happen. But you can literally click and drag on any of those emitters and you can really sit and fiddle with the costumes uh, and just pull out the right color without, you know, having to cut new color, climb up ladders, change filters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this is the thing about LED that excites me the most because this is an incredibly powerful tool. It's something we've just never been able to do before. Um, and I think it's hugely powerful to have this control at your fingertips really quickly and easily in, in a tech session uh, to be able to just sit and go, right, you know what? Love this color, but that blue is just, it's too much. I just want to dial it back a bit or it needs a bit more behind to bring the pinks out a bit or whatever it is. And you can just sit and, uh, and, and fiddle with these colors. One thing to be aware of though, is this uh, hold color point only works if you have the fixtures set in direct mode. Uh, there are two main modes that the fixtures run in, direct and HSIC. HSIC, hue, saturation, intensity, and color temperature. That's our preferred mode of running the fixtures. And the reason we prefer it is because it is the only mode in the fixtures that's calibrated. Um, and I'll come back and spend a bit more time on, on calibration in a second. But the theory behind calibrated fittings is that because we've calibrated them, if you're in HSIC mode, we'll pretty much guarantee that when you hit leave 58 all your fixtures are going to look the same there won't be any sort of variations um uh popping up in in your colors um is there any uh questions anything anybody wants to throw at me before we move on i don't know if you saw in the chat there declan there's one uh, fred said does this only work with etc fixtures um no uh, uh, it works best with our fixtures, obviously, because we've actually got the fixtures and we've been able to test them and we've calibrated them and we know what's what's there. It is as successful as the data is that we've received from Carillon and their data is as good as they've received it from, from the manufacturer. Um, so it will work on any fixture. Um, it's how well it works, I can't guarantee, because it, it depends on how accurate the color information is that we've been sent that we've been able to plumb into the console. Um, but in theory, yes, it will work on anyone's fixture. Um, one little flag, it does need at least four colors to be able to work because you need that fourth color to be able to start creating metamers. So anything with more than four colors, um, and uh, it, it'll absolutely work. Um, I'm not seeing the chat. I don't have a little chat window open on my screen, or is if you do catch any other questions, um, do, sure, do sure. shout. Um, yeah. Yo, Ian. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm I, I can't, I'm currently using uh, a smart aid um, ML, mm -hmm. and I'm using two color source pars. Now you said about taking the either using the hue and saturation thing or using something else. I'm usually using the, the hue and saturation wheels on it. Is there a way that I can do the other side, the other the other part of that, or is it or is or is it stuck onto the the hue and saturation? Um, I think it might be stuck on hue and saturation, but I think that's a color source thing and not a not a fixture thing. Um, right. Okay. I think I think that's the only way. If I remember correctly, sorry, did you say you're on a sm smart fade console? Uh, yeah, smart fade yeah. ML. I, I seem to think, and I, it's been a long time since I've been on smart fade, but I seem to think the only way to mix color on smart fade is hue and saturation. I don't believe they give you the individual right. emitters. Um, yeah, because I, so, I, I so, know so, that yeah. Sorry, no, no, I was going to say, so the, 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 the mode exists on the fixtures. You can either run them in, in uh, actually on color source, that's not true. Color source, the modes are slightly different. Um, you've got, you right, either run them as RGB or direct or direct or six, five, six, five channel mode, six channel mode, five channel, six channel. Rawr. I really should know the answer to this question, but there, there are a couple of modes. Their, their modes are slightly different on, on the color source, um, uh, on the color source fixture. Um, but again, on something like color source, uh, if you're running in the direct mode, I believe direct mode on color source is the calibrated mode because they don't have the HSIC mode. Okay. Um, but I, running I, them as RGB or uh, or full six channel mode doesn't give you any calibration. Okay, on the on and, and just going back to your your thing about the when you were talking about the deep red um, on the color palette, 
um, on uh, the ML. Um, the the first the first red, which is kind of like a, a really really kind of deep red. I take it that's not the deep red that you were talking about. Uh, could be. It's but, it's it's been out for a while. I mean, the only um, the only fixtures that have the deep red at the moment are the phosphor Fresnel and the phosphor right. panel. Okay. Um, the that said, the the red that's in the color source is is a is a decent red emitter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, it, I think uh, if I'm, I could be speaking under correction, but I think it, it may have been the sort of forerunner to the to the sort of deep red um, thing. Because I, I know I know it's it's a more recent emitter than the uh, red that lives in in the series two lusters. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Color path is is another really powerful tool um, when when you're sitting and programming, um, and basically what it does is it gives you the ability to choose how you want to uh, get from color A to color B. And I, I can't remember how how well this video demos that, so I'll talk you through it and then I'll, I'll play the video. It won't be long, um, but you know you know what it's like. You've you know you're going from, for argument's sake, a green to a pink which is probably not something you do terribly often but as you as you sort of go through those colors you might end up with something really sort of murky and ugly in the middle or worst case scenario you're going from a blue to a red and you go through this quite sort of vicious magenta uh in the middle color path gives you a way to control excuse me to control that and to work around and sort of manipulate how you get from color a uh color a to color b <coughs> excuse me and that's in this little color path menu. There's a little drop down menu that I think will pop down in the video. And there's a couple of options in there. Um, and I think the video sort of shows you some different options and you'll see how that color path changes uh, on that fixture. I'll sort of try and do some voiceover with the video as it goes. Um, yeah, so we're starting off. I think this example actually does go from a lovely green to pink. So we start off in green. Uh, yeah, and we end up in pink, which is a crossfade. Of course, we all do. Um, and when you select that channel, uh, it gives you some uh, some color path options. Gel is the first one, and what gel is is it says, imagine you were two fixtures in colors and emulate what would happen if I was cross fading, you know, in a straight line between those two fixtures. Uh, if I pop up the next one that it's going to throw at us, will be. Uh, you can choose the CIE model and you can see we're, we're sort of, it's forcing us through the yellow. So we're avoiding that little bit of, um, a little bit of sort of murky brown. And you've got various sliders. You've got sort of brightness sliders that you can control um, to sort of manipulate that color a little bit more. And if you come down and set hue saturation, for instance, there you can see how it's changed the path of that light going. And now by adjusting those sliders, you can see on that little color path, how that light is going to sort of get from one color to another. And I don't know if this video does it, but just above those sliders, there's these little sort of play buttons. Uh, once you've set your path, you can test it over five seconds or a 10 seconds, uh, and it'll actually play that back. So you can see what it's like before you commit it uh, into the memory of the console. Oh, there we go, it does show that. Uh, cool. Um, the next little thing I just wanted to chat about. This is again, a, it's it's a it's a phrase we've come up with. It's it's not a real thing. This is our this is our little bit of marketing that's that's attached to it. But but we talk about our fixtures as having color integrity technology, and basically it's a clever way of saying to people there are inherent problems with LED that you need to be aware of. And we've done some work to try and correct them uh, as much as possible. And when we speak of color integrity technology, we're talking about LED binning. We're talking about the calibration of the fixtures. We're also talking about droop compensation and thermal management. Uh, and um, Rory, how are we for time at the moment? 
uh, where are we are, we're just sort of on an hour. Um, then there's the next little video, which is about five minutes long. Um, and then there's yeah, not yeah. too much after that. So if that's okay, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll run through that. Um, does it play by itself? Of course, question is, do you get sound? Ah, yeah. Are you hearing the video? No, no, no. So what we might have to do is if you, basically when you go to do screen share, there's a little box that you tick that says, um, uh, use computer audio. So you'd have to stop and start again on the old screen share. Uh, where is so? So, or uh, see view options up the top, possibly. Mm. Uh, and the other options I can kind of just sort of, I can actually probably talk you through it. It'll probably save us a little bit of time. Okay. Um, it might be slightly easier, actually. Let me just do that. So, oh, no, there we go. Now it's playing again. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, um, just to, to uh, save us some time from, from me trying to wrap my head around technology, um, basically, all that little video is, is it talks about what we call L70 and LM84. And these are the two tests that uh, LEDs. Uh, are supposed to be put through by the manufacturers and it's it's how they generate the information that's on their spec sheet. You'll often, I mean, when LEDs first came out, uh, you know, when they started becoming a thing, people were advertising as having 100,000 hours lamp life and all these sort of incredible numbers. And then as we started to use them, they realized that actually LEDs get really, really hot and they give off a huge amount of heat and they starting to fail. Um, and so they had to slowly but surely revise uh, uh, how they were specking the life of an LED. And basically they came up with a test called the L70. And what that is, is they're saying that uh, they consider the life of an LED uh, to be as long as the point where it reaches 70% of its uh, of its nominal output. So as soon as it's, it's only at 70% of its uh, original output, they consider that to be end of life. Because LEDs don't sort of, burn out like a tungsten lamp is they just get progressively dimmer they just slowly slowly get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and dimmer until eventually they just stop working so they came up with the l70 system which is they're saying at 70 percent of its life 70 percent of its output that's considered end of life uh, for those fixtures um so obviously you know they could go on for a lot more but they're reckoning beyond that you know the, the, the light output is probably not going to be great and uh, to do that, they, they ran a series of tests because, you know, obviously they couldn't physically run the fixed, run the LEDs for a long enough period because um, things would never get out to market. So what they do is you run the fixtures in uh, batches of a thousand hours and you measure the light output at each end of those thousand hours. You have to run that test at least six times. So 6,000 hours I, for math serves, I think is about eight months. So it's eight months to get this L70 rating. Um, so across 6,000 hours, they do some maths and they go, well, that extrapolates out and your lifespan is X. Um, and you end up usually around sort of 50, 54,000 hours as being your sort of typical um, LED lamp life. The problem is though, what that is, is that is the LED itself, the emitter itself. Um, so that's not terribly accurate because what happens is manufacturers would say, for instance, um, yeah, LEDs have got 54,000 hours, which they do coming out of the factory. What happens is then the manufacturers put drivers in and they overdrive the LEDs to uh, get more light out of them or they don't cool them properly. All these sort of things uh, have an effect on the fixture. So you end up with something that doesn't actually deliver the full lifespan of the lamp. So what they then developed was a test called LM84. And that basically is the, the complete fixture. So not just the emitter, it's the whole fixture in its working environment under working conditions. And again, it's the same set of tests. It's done by an independent lab. So a manufacturer has to send the fixture away and this test gets done again in thousand hour chunks uh, for a minimum of 6,000 hours. And you end up with the LM84 uh, rating and the LM84 is far more accurate as to what the fixture is actually going to be able to deliver. So when you are looking at different manufacturers and different fixtures and you're looking at the spec sheets, uh, an L70 doesn't really mean that much. You should be looking at the LM84 uh, value. That's, that's a closer and more accurate um, uh, lifespan measurement tool, if you like. 
Um, so that was that sort of five minute video um, squashed down into uh, a minute. Um, fine. So uh, next thing that we want to talk about is LED binning. And this is probably not new to you because it, it's been around for a while. But basically, um, LEDs are a bit like baking cookies um, in that we know what the ingredients are. You know that there needs to be flour and sugar and butter and some chocolate chips and you stick them all in a bowl and you mix them together and you put them in the oven and you're going to get chocolate chip cookies. The problem is when they come out, not all the chocolate chip cookies are the same. They're all slightly different. One's got more chips in than the other, one's slightly bigger than the other, one's risen than the other. There are these sort of slight differences. They're chocolate chip, but they're different. And it's the same thing with LEDs. Uh, it's not a fine science. They get huge boards of these chips. They paint the chemical on, stick it in the oven, and they bake the LEDs. And when they come out, they then test each LED. And based on those test results, the LEDs are sorted into bins. And um, basically, they are checked for color consistency. They're checked for brightness consistency. Well, that's all they checked for, actually. I don't know why I said it like there was another point. They checked for color and brightness consistency, and then they're sorted into bins. So, for instance, a blue LED might range from 460 nanometers to 480 nanometers, and they will sort those into bins at five nanometer intervals. So, you as a manufacturer can come along and go, I want only blues in my fixture that are 470 nanometers. And obviously, the number of those out of a batch are going to be smaller. So, the price goes up. So, uh, the more expensive fixtures tend to have LEDs from narrower bins in them. And that's how you're able to get color consistency across uh, all the fixtures. Um, our approach is slightly different. Uh, what we tend to do is we're not that specific on the bin. Uh, we might take a sort of what I would call a three bin wide range. So anything from 465 to 475. But then what we do is we take those LEDs and we put them all into a pot and we mix them together and then we populate our arrays. So within our array, you might have some 465, some 470s, some 475s that go in there. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in there in terms of how we make up our arrays. But A, that means we can keep our costs down. But that's when the fixture calibration side comes into play. So what we do is each array basically is going to be unique. And when we build the fixture, we plug it into this machine and it runs a series of quite complex tests and algorithms across this fixture. And basically then, does the maths and works out exactly what each emitter is putting out, uh, measures it, does all the maths and the clever things on it. And basically what we're doing is we give every fixture its own unique digital fingerprint so that we can guarantee that every fixture that's coming out is going to match uh, color, match intensity, all those kind of things, because that's hugely important. You'll know that when LED first started coming out, you know, you'd buy four fittings this month and four fittings six months later and the colors will be completely different um, because of different batches of LEDs, different, you know, assemblies of arrays, all that kind of thing. So we've taken that side of it away by calibrating all the fixtures. Uh, and something else we do is we use what we call a weighted array. So you remember when, when fixtures first came out, they used to be, you know, if it was I'll keep the math simple for myself. If there were 30 emitters, it would be 10 red, 10 green, 10 blue. And that was the thing. And obviously that wasn't great because the blue emitter is much more powerful. So that's why you'd always get that weird sort of purpley white light as a sort of default when everything was up at full. Whereas our arrays, our arrays are weighted. So we might only have two blues and three reds and five greens and how, whatever that combination is to give you a uh, consistent um, output and then that tied into the calibration process uh, guarantees a sort of unique uh, footprint on each fixture and it also ensures some sort of uniformity of color and output. Um, a big thing that most people are not aware of is something called droop compensation and um, I don't know if you're aware of it but as as LEDs get hot uh, they actually become less efficient and they actually dim down and a red LED, for instance, will lose as much as 40% of its output as it heats up, which is huge. I mean, that's that's well, it's almost half of your light is gone as it heats up. And it heats up quite quickly. This is not a sort of, you know, over a nine hour tech. I mean, LEDs, you know, they get hot pretty much as soon as they fire up. So um, 
so what we've done is we've measured all the LEDs and we've factored all this in and we've incorporated into our fixtures some droop compensation algorithms. So what we know is we know what the droop of each color is and we balance that accordingly. So when you turn your fixture on, we've, for argument's sake, slightly underrunning the red. And as it heats up and it becomes more inefficient, we're increasing that red. So we're always matching your colors because uh, otherwise, you know, you dial up 201 at the start of the day and the 201 that you had at the end of the day would be a completely different color. Um, so that's something else that's, uh, that's going on in the background that um, a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, and it, it's huge and, and, and a great test for this. If you're ever trying out, uh, you know, you're doing a shoot up with fixtures, a really good thing to do is get all the manufacturers to bring two fixtures, two samples of everything and turn them all on and set them all into a color and preferably something that uses red because red is, is the worst offender for this droop compensation. So put them in a nice amber or a nice purple or something like that uh, and then turn one of them off uh, and go and have a cup of tea and come back in 15 minutes, 20 minutes time and turn them back on again and they will all be different colors. Almost all, except for ours. Ours will be the same. Um, but everybody else's will be a different color because of this droop compensation. Um, and you know, you may not notice it sitting in a tech for eight hours because you're sort of watching the stage and you're seeing things change. But come showtime or come preview time where the lights are actually turning on for the first time for the show, uh, all of a sudden your colors are going to look weird or your intensities are not going to be right. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, and the other thing, sorry, there's a slide missing, um, was uh, thermal management. And that obviously is a big thing with LEDs is, is keeping them cool. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're aware of noise and venues, um, but cooling the LEDs is, is a huge part of, of what gives them their, their life and their sort of longevity. Um, I don't want to spend too much time going through this uh, stuff. It's really just a little bit of FYI. Um, everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with CRI, Color Rendering Index. Um, it used to be how we would talk about lights, and a lot of manufacturers are still using CRI. You'll get a spec sheet. Um, and they go, oh, it's a CRI of 95. CRI, when it comes to LED, is actually meaningless. It no longer works. Color rendering index was designed for fluorescent fixtures um, originally, and it was only ever intended as a measure against white light. As soon as you've got fixtures that have multiple color emitters, color rendering index just no longer works because that's not how it's sort of put together. It's, it's not what that metric was designed to do. Um, so I'm always wary when I see, you know, high CRI specs on, on LED fixtures because um, it, it's not terribly accurate. So CRI uh, uses 15 colors uh, as the sort of basis for their, um, for their metric. And of those 15 colors, they actually only use eight of them to give you that CRI score. And these are the eight that they use. So it's none of the saturates. Uh, it's all the sort of slightly paler um, tints. Um, and that kind of, for me, is, is, is where the system falls down, is, is it's not hugely accurate because there's, there's a huge chunk of that spectrum that you're just not getting a sort of accurate uh, reading through. Um, and to use the other colors is kind of optional. They, a lot of the specifications don't put the readings against these colors in there, which is why the CRI index kind of falls down a little bit. Um, so CRI is measured on a scale of zero to 100, um, and, and a, an RA value or a CRI value of anywhere between 85 to 95 is seen as good. The problem with CRI is, is it doesn't tell you which way the light is wrong. You might get a, a fixture that has a high CRI. You can have a you know, CRI of sort of 90, 95, but it still looks green because that's not what CRI is measuring. CRI is ticking across those little eight boxes going, yeah, right, it renders those fine, great. But maybe it, it's off to the green or off to the blue, or off to the orange side of the spectrum. So it's not uh, a hugely... Uh, useful thing. And it's also possible as you, said, you can game a light source, you can you can tweak your light source, you can put an extra little green emitter in there to get it to pop out that one color to give you a higher um, uh, RA uh, reading. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a fuzzy system. So what we tend to see is a shift across to TM30. 
uh, and there's actually an update on this, which is TM3018, uh, last updated in 2018. And basically what it does is it uses 99 colors. It's a sample of 99 colors across the spectrum. And then there's a graph of how accurately it renders each of those 99 uh, colors across the spectrum. So it's a far more accurate um, uh, rendering system. Um, so TM30 is technical Miranda 30, 2018 is the last one. It's based on 99 colors. Uh, and it gives you two values. They talk about an RF and an RG, which I'll go through in a sec. Uh, and they also give you a polar diagram, which is uh, super useful. So RF is your color fidelity. So it's how well it renders colors. So it's similar to CRI. Uh, and again, on a scale of zero to 100. And the RG is your color saturation. So how well it deals uh, with saturated colors. And it's anywhere from 60 to 140. Um, with uh, 100 being your, your midpoint. Uh, and then it also generates this polar diagram. And basically what that's telling you is you can see um, that this light, you know, it, it's, it favors, it tends to be more saturated out towards the greener side of the spectrum, less so down to the blue side of the spectrum. And again, picks up a little bit here on the warm. So straight away, you can see Yes, it's ticking the boxes. It's got, you know, 91 is pretty good. 105 is not bad. Um, but at least you've got a sense now of, of which way that color is is sort of pulling. So it gives you a much more accurate sense of, um, of how this all goes together. Uh, and that's what a full TM30 report should look like. And this is what all manufacturers uh, are starting to issue now for their fixtures because it's becoming the industry standard. More so architecturally, uh, but we are seeing it more and more uh, on the theater fixtures and the entertainment fixtures and things that are uh, coming through as well. Um, and I don't know why that's slide repeats, uh, copy and paste. Um, there we go. Uh, and I believe that is the end of my uh, waffle. So I'm going to stop sharing. Perfect. Right, thank you for that. That's brilliant. I, I was, yeah, it's, uh, that was news to me tomorrow. That's good back. Good to hear. Um, so yeah, uh, it's sort of plowed through a little bit at the end because I'm sort of a little bit mindful of time. Um, but uh, yeah, if there's any questions, um, feel free, fire away. Anything else doesn't have to be related to what we've chatted about. Anything sort of color related, I'm, I'm happy to chat about. Um, we had an interesting discussion um, a little while ago about how we're actually going to be dealing with color and how we're going to start talking about color because you know there's there's going to be a generation of designers coming. Um, who don't know why 201 is a pale blue and, and why should it be that there's no sort of, you know, there's no real sort of reason behind that. So I think, I think there's, there's some interesting color conversations uh, to be had. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is. I wonder if the filter colors don't become like a Pantone, don't become our version of a Pantone. So, you know, something that, that is a 201 has to tick, you know, the following boxes. Um, maybe that's where it's going to go. I don't know. Um, but uh, I suspect we're going to have to put everybody in a room and just let them fight it out for a, for a while to see what, you know, how it all sticks. Yeah, yeah. I think the Pantone thing is, uh, is quite a good way to go, actually. But um, obviously it has quite a lot of... Uh, it's quite an expensive way to do it. <laughs> it is an expensive way to do it. And... Um, you know the, the problem it was yeah as soon, as soon as it becomes a standard it becomes expensive and then you know for a console to put it in they have to pay a royalty for whoever's you know come up with the standard and, and then everything just starts becoming a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated which is perhaps why no one sort of made any real moves in that direction yet mm -hmm. um i think it was kelly who's proposed that color is going to be spoken of in as a sort of three word um metric uh, and I, I might not, might not have been Kelly. I can't, I'm pretty sure it was. And she's proposing that we will end up talking about color um, with a descriptive word, with an emotive word, and then with the actual color. So for instance, you might mix a color that might be uh, dirty, sad, pink, or, okay. um, you know, lively, happy blue, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, which 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 would be interesting. The, 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 of course, the problem for that is it means everybody's going to be walking around with their own color palettes because, mm 
my idea of happy, lively blue is probably not going to be the same as your idea of, of yeah. happy, lively blue. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. I think I'm, I'm keen to see. Yeah. That's nice because it, it sort of acknowledges that they're different. Whereas just now we've got, um, you know, endless uh, programmers and files going around with what they think 200 is. Um, and it's called Lee 200. Um, so at least with the three, the three word thing, there is a sort of acknowledgement that um, it's my 200 as a word in inverted commas. Um, I just spotted Dan in the chat there. Yeah, uh, yeah just saw you, that. Um, how do you feel out um, for the recording, but how do you feel color and choice uh, of it for design will be affected by this shift into live streaming and recording of performances? I mean, well, just recording performances in general is 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 difficult, really. I mean, it's become easier as camera technology has improved. I mean, I remember, you know, doing shows and the sort of TV, we would dread the TV crews coming in because, you know, they would come in and they would hang, you know, six 5K Fresnels on the balcony and just whack some white light into the front of the stage and that was it lit for TV and, you know, all your, your hard work was sort of gone. Um and and that, that there's been a huge shift in in that approach. Um, I mean, I think I think the big thing when doing anything for camera is is the white balance. You know, make make sure you you take the time and you do your white balance and and you you set you you agree on what that balance point is going to be. Whether it's tungsten daylight or anything in between, we normally do a balance of about four K because it sort of sits nicely in the middle. Um, and then you only have to adjust a few little things, either up or down, to suit on camera. Um, but, it, I mean, it's changed. I mean, I remember that red used to be the colour that you would never use, you know, that camera used to hate. And now it's blue because that LED blue, the camera just can't deal with it. It's just, it's too intense a blue. So it's all shifted and the whole process has changed. Um, uh, I mean, to answer your question more specifically, Dan, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think there's a lot of it is is going to be a bit sort of suck it and see really and just see see what happens but you know tools like color path like the the hold color point those sort of things i think are going to be hugely helpful moving forwards to doing things because you can quickly respond you can see something on cameras looking too green mm. you can grab those fixtures and you can dial out a bit of green but but keep the look that you've created and i think that sort of thing is is hugely important yeah definitely definitely it's also interesting that the the white balancing, the color balancing thing is really interesting because I was, I was talking to someone recently about how uh, basically their monitor that they were looking through was what wasn't calibrated. So they right. did the whole thing thinking it was great. And then when the broadcast came out, they were like, what? That's... And the cameraman was like, well, this is what it's looked like the whole time. <laughs> and they were like, well, I didn't know that because my monitor wasn't right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the other, the other issue. And we did... Um... Uh, I, I lit something for Lucia at the Scala and they had a, a Japanese TV crew come in who were launching a 4K, uh, no, 8, 8K, the first 8K broadcast channel. And these guys were shooting in 8K. And the quality, I mean, what they were capturing was just extraordinary. But I remember the, the, the producer going to the set designer going, um, there's, there's fingerprints on that mirror. I mean, they were picking that up from the balcony at the Scala. That camera was zooming in and they could see somebody's grubby paw print on the, you know, on the mirror. And the designer's like, well, off your crap, mate. Go and clean it then if it bothers you. It's like, well, it's not my problem. Yeah. Um, oh, but, uh, uh, wow. but yeah, it's, it's, it's all going to change. Um, and I think the ability to be flexible and, and adapt is, is important. And I think we're at, actually at the stage now where the technology is able to do that and it can actually support us in those choices. Yeah. Um, you know, five, 10 years ago, it would have been a, a really different situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, it would definitely be a much more uh, noticeable uphill struggle, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Well, if anyone has any questions, this is your... Uh, oh, hold on. Sorry. Lies. Dan has said something in the chat. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's like I'm saying on Friday about how you had to phantom in pink to get the right colour on the screen. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, um, yeah, so if that's it, then Declan, thank you so, so much. Um, unless anyone has any last questions. No? Uh, so it feels a bit like an auction, doesn't it? Sorry, go and go and go on. Going once, um, going twice. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Declan, because that that's dead interesting and really useful to, to know as well, actually. So. You're most welcome. Um, just a quick plug. I did put it in the chat in case anyone hasn't seen it. Um, first Friday of every month, we do our Light Bites event. 
Uh, different topic every Friday. We start at sort of 4.30 because we all start with gin, I'll be quite honest. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, our next one is coming up this Friday and we're talking about associations. Uh, we've got a great panel. We've got um, the ALD, ABTT, Plaza, uh, WIL, ILP, uh, SBTD, STLD. I mean, so many acronyms. It's no. just, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm actually just throwing, I'm throwing letters at you now. It's not even people yeah. who are attending now. So that, you know, there's P, Q, Z and, you know. Yeah, most of the alphabet's coming along. <laughs> most of the alphabet's going to be there. Actually, that's, I'm going to, that's nice. I'm going to use that. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, so uh, yeah, uh, the link is the link is there in the chat. Do register. Um, you know, come along and and just have a chat. And you know, you can ask some questions. You can tell them you think their fees are too high or not high enough or whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but yeah, do do join us. Uh, and it is first Friday of every month, so uh, there'll be another one in December. Um, and actually, I'm super sorry, I'm going on a bit. Super excited about the one we've got planned for February because we're not going to do one for January, obviously, because you know, first Friday is like eh, we're all still hungover. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one in February, I don't know if anyone's seen it. There's a series on Netflix at the moment called Little Birds. Mm. And it has been spectacularly lit. It is just gorgeous. And I have their cinematographer coming oh, to brilliant. join us for Light Bites uh, the first Friday of February. Chat right. called Ed Rutherford. Uh, I'm super stoked about that. I'm really, really excited. It's yeah. just, for TV lighting, it is just extraordinary. I mean, he's lit. He's like lit people with like RGB sources okay. to create white light but you're getting these shadows on their faces and it's just glorious really spectacular yeah that sounds um, brilliant mm, yeah it's lovely absolutely lovely so anyway so he'll be with us in february but don't wait for then join us this friday and come yeah, and join absolutely. us in december again um but yeah thank you very much everybody um good to see you i uh, hope it's useful as always if you need any help drop us a line ping us an email uh and we'll do what we can to help perfect thank you declan